Have the continents moved apart? And if they have, how long ago? How the Bible explains the world's geology today on Creation Magazine Live. The origins debate is a debate about explaining how we observe, how the, the things that we observe today, right. how they came to be. That's what the origins debate is all about. It, it involves combining scientific observations. We observe things through telescopes and microscopes and that right. kind of thing. And, and telling stories, historical accounts, as to how the things we observe got here. That's the origins debate. That's what it's all about. Right. Now, evolutionists typically uh, talk about their origin story as if it's the only way to explain the things that we observe. Right. And in doing so in that way, it's almost like they're talking about their story about history as if it were fact. Because it, if that's all you hear, you think, well, that's, just, that, that's it. That, that's got to be the only possible way you can explain that. But there's got to be dozens of explanations, really. When you're talking about something that you know, supposedly has happened in the past, you know, so you, you could explain it many different ways about how those, how the things we observe could could have got to right, here. Right. So the challenge really is this: it's deciding which one of those versions of history is the best explanation. Uh, just because someone has an explanation doesn't mean it's the best, and which one is the best? Right. So today on, today on Creation Magazine Live, we're going to talk about geology, what we what we observe in geology, right. large scale, like continent wide geologic features. Right. We're going to be talking about continental drift and plate tectonics. Uh, that's, our, that's our topic today. The current theory that incorporates seafloor spreading, uh, spreading and continental drift is called plate tectonics. Right. Now, before the 1960s, most geologists thought that the continents were, were stationary. Now, today, of course, that, that opinion is totally reversed. And it's interesting that the first person that actually proposed the concept of uh, continental drift was a creationist. Um, in, That's right. in, in 1859, Antonio Snyder proposed that the continents had moved during the Genesis flood. And uh, statements in Genesis, of course, uh, 1, 9 to 10 about the gathering together of seas in one place, uh, that kind of indicated that, you know, there might have been one landmass in the beginning. That's what actually influenced his thinking in, in proposing that, that theory. Right. You can see some, uh, some drawings here that he made, creationist Antonio Snyder. So geologists point to a number of evidences that the continents have moved apart. For example, the fit of the continents, taking into account the continental shelves. That's a, a pretty major evidence. And then we have, there again, are the drawings by, uh, by Antonio Snyder, showing that the fit of the continents. Illustrate the same thing that evolutionists are uh, alluding to, of course. That's right. Yeah, another evidence is the correlation of fossil types across ocean basins. And here we can see a picture of their similar fossil types if you put the continents back together going from continent to continent. That's an evidence that they were once joined together. Another evidence, a zebra stripe pattern of magnetic reversals parallel to the mid-ocean floor rifts in the volcanic rock formed along those rifts, implying seafloor spreading along the rifts. And we can look at it graphically here. As the new ocean floor is created, in other words, as the continents are pulled apart, the magnetic field of the Earth is flipping back and forth. And that reversal, those magnetic reversals, are recorded in the rocks in the mantle. And another one, seismic observations interpreted as slabs of former ocean floor now located inside the Earth. Uh, measurements have been made of, of uh, the, the rock and the temperature, the density of some of the rock down there. Right. It's, it's pretty clear that those are the ocean plates and they haven't yet totally melted. Right. So here's common uh, scientific theory uh, in geology, uh, accepted by most secular geologists today. Um, many times evolutionists have, have said things like, well, you know, uh, creationists, you're not scientific. Uh, you guys can't make accurate predictions, uh, all sorts of things. You're relying on the Bible. Why would you trust, you know, this, this book written by people? You know, they don't take it as the, as yes, the authority yes, yes, of the Word yes. of God. And I think, find it's very interesting that here you have a situation in geology, in the sciences, proposed by a creationist way before the, the, the evolutionists ever, ever thought of this. Right. Making that, 
you know, hypothesis based on the scripture. So he, he's looking at God's wor world, right? He's looking at the way the continents could fit together and all that stuff. Right. But then he's looking through the Bible because he's like, okay, well, how did we get here? Right? Then he sees the passages of scripture saying, oh, wait a sec. Yeah, you know, maybe at the time of the flood and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and doing so, you know, decades, well, hundreds of years, actually, a hundred years before uh, evolutionists made the same, same idea. So, so both creationists and evolutionists agree that the continents have moved apart. Right, but yes. But how and, and when they moved apart, well, that's the matter of debate, which we're going to discuss today. In 1923, American microscopist Theophilus Painter announced to the world that humans have 48 chromosomes. This number was repeated like a mantra for several decades until plant cytologist Albert Levan announced in 1956 that it was wrong. The actual number is 46. The wrong information repeated frequently enough often becomes accepted as fact. This is known as reinforcement syndrome. Many eminent scientists accepted that humans had 48 chromosomes, even though their microscopes said otherwise. The same scenario exists with the supposed extinction of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Much evidence suggests it's wrong, such as historical accounts of dragons that sound like dinosaurs, and the existence of blood cells and proteins in dinosaur fossils. However, the idea that dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago has become very hard to dislodge. This is another example of reinforcement syndrome. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. I think it's important to point out here that evolutionists have explanations for continent-wide or global geology. But just because evolutionists have explanations for these things, it doesn't mean that those are the only, that their explanation is the only explanation or that it's even the best explanation. Right. There could be many other explanations. The challenge that Christians are facing, of course, is that um, these interpretations of the facts, of the evidence that we see today, their, their evolutionary interpretations don't fit with what the Bible says. Right. So you've got many Christians saying, well, maybe science has disproven the Bible, or maybe we need to reinterpret the Bible differently than the way we've always interpreted it, uh, these types of things. But they're not facts that are, in, that are refuting the Bible. They're facts, things we observe, that have been interpreted according to an evolutionary worldview, and then those conclusions don't match up with what the Bible says. Right. Right? And millions of years, death before sin, all these things we've covered before. Um, so it, it, it really is... Uh, down to, hey, can, can we as Christians take the facts that we see, uh, the things we observe today, can they be interpreted in a way that actually fits with what the Bible says? And of course the answer is yes. And those interpretations often fit the facts much better than the evolutionary explanations do because there's they big do. holes That's in right. some of their, uh, some of their and explanations. It's very much the case with our topic today on Creation Magazine Live. So mm -hmm. what is the creationist explanation right. for these evidences that the continents broke apart? The continent broke apart during the flood. Right. That's, that's our starting point. And by the way, Noah's flood was more than just 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, Noah was on the ark for a little over a year, if you add up the whole time, from door closed to door open on the ark. So we have, we have about a year to work with here to break up the supercontinent. Right. Um, now, some people have asked uh, about this breaking up of the continents. Um, could this have happened in the days of Peleg? Right. right, you hear that asked yes. uh, quite a few times, because in Genesis 10, uh, 25, it says, To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth, the Hebrew word Eretz, was divided. So here, here's why people are asking that question. Well, the earth was divided. Uh, but only eight, eight verses later in Genesis 11, 1, it says, Now the whole earth, again the word Eretz, had one language and one speech. We can see how that word is being used in, in, in two different ways here, right? The whole earth, and then the, the old earth had one language. Well, obviously that's talking about the people that are on the earth. Right, right? the people of the earth, not the physical earth Not itself. the physical earth. So earth here is referring to the language of the people uh, on the earth and not the physical earth itself. So this is obviously referring to the Tower of Babel, where yes. God split up the languages, and so the people were divided, but not the earth they were standing right. on. If, if this event that we're about to describe took place with people living on the continents, they would have been killed. That's, it's, it's very, very catastrophic. Right, right. And we can go through a number of things just to explain what this, what this was all about. This is called catastrophic plate tectonics. And, uh, and, and here are some points. Uh, Dr. John Baumgartner uh, developed this model. He was working at Los Alamos National Laboratories in the USA. That's a famous uh, 
uh, scientific outfit in the USA. He was using supercomputers, very, very powerful computers, uh, to do the calculations, the computations for all of the, the conservation of energy and the thermodynamics and everything that needs to go in there. He's acknowledged as having developed the best 3D supercomputer model of plate tectonics. The model has been independently duplicated and thus verified by others. So other folks are coming up with models that, that are, are showing the same thing. Right. And Dr. Baumgartner is a creationist. Mm -hmm. That's the, perhaps the most surprising point of this. Right, because we, we commonly hear this thing, you know, I've even got, you know, sometimes we answer skeptical emails that get sent into the ministry, et cetera. Right. And, and it's a very common thing for skeptics to write in and say, oh, well, you're scientists, and they put scientists in square, uh, scare quotes. Right. And, and the, right. it's a belittling uh, is what they're trying to do. And they're trying to say, well, you're not real scientists. Well, folks, there are real scientists out there that believe the Bible. And here's the world's leading expert here. Um, and you, you can actually see uh, one of the outputs here from the supercomputer model um, early in the process. Here's an animation showing the original fit of the continents and uh, the movement to their, their current location. This is all based on Dr. Baumgartner's um, study, of course. It's interesting because really, once again, you've got creationists and evolutionists basically agreeing that, okay, that these events have happened, right? But based it's, on it's the data. We, we all data, agree on the data. Right? It's the time frame. It's yes. always the time frame that, that, that seems to be the, the, the bone of contention. So we're going to talk more about these details uh, in the next segment coming up. Many Christians today have a diminished view of the Bible because they can't answer questions like, is there really a God? What about evolution? Are there facts to back up the Bible? Or is it all just faith? Creation Ministries expert speakers visit churches all over the world to help pastors equip their congregations to understand that the whole Bible, even Genesis, is accurate. We help to demolish the arguments that the world uses to try to convince people that the Bible isn't true. For more information on getting a CMI speaker to visit your church, contact your nearest CMI office through our website. Okay, catastrophic plate tectonics. That's what we're talking about here. How does this model work? Well, it basically begins with you have a heavy ocean floor. The ocean, the, the, the material at the bottom of the ocean is heavier today, would have been the same before the flood as well, than the continent material. So the heavy ocean floor, that's why we have oceans where we do, because the ocean floors are lower right. and water runs off the continents. That would have started sinking into the mantle. So the heavy ocean floor sinks into the mantle and that creates friction which heats some of the mantle material, friction creates heat and so on, which lowers the viscosity of the mantle material, causing the plate to sink faster. So gravity wants to pull this toward the core and you have that weakening of the mantle and that leads, this is what the supercomputer model demonstrates here, the, right. the world's best 3D modeling, that leads to a runaway event, runaway subduction. The plate is subducted, it's pulled, it's sinking into the earth, being pulled by gravity in a conveyor belt like style. So the entire pre-flood ocean floor is pulled rapidly into the earth as the friction, as the viscosity is lowered in the mantle. And that's, that's, base, that's the basic model. Right, and of course uh, at top speeds, this is looking like it's happening at like meters per second, right? 20 kilometers an hour. Somewhere in that ballpark, which just blows your mind. Yeah, it, it's that. not a couple of inches per year as the evolution The residual said, motion is, today, yeah. 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 Now, meanwhile, in other areas, a uh, new ocean floor is going to be forming to replace the old sinking ocean floor. So um, the hot areas in this picture uh, that you can see indicate where molten rock would have formed new ocean floor. And you can see the temperature scale in the lower right there. This hot sea floor would have vaporized huge amounts of seawater, resulting in a global rainfall of about three feet per hour. You know, many people have said, well, where'd the water, you know, where'd the 40 days of, 40 nights of rain come from? Well, there you are. And of course, this, this uh, could be the fountains of the deep that are mentioned in Genesis. Yeah, right? this, so here's a model that explains uh, the, where the rainfall came the from. The words that we, we have in the yes. Bible, yeah. And the darker blue areas are actually the subduction zones, where the pre-flood ocean plates are being pulled into the earth by gravity. And, and also note the vectors, the arrows uh, indicating speed and direction. Look at India moving up and Asia moving down. Uh, this would be where they collide. That would be where we get the Himalayas, of course. So if the continents were moving slowly, as evolutionists suggest, it's doubtful that there'd be enough energy to push up the Himalayas. I mean, here's something, you know, you take two cars out in the parking lot, you bump into each other at two kilometers an hour, 
you're not getting a lot, not of, a lot of damage. No. Do it at 200 kilometers an hour. Of course, you're going to get that that massive Huge and, and crumple zone. Exactly, a crumple zone where you get the two continents coming and you get mountain building. It's it makes sense of what we see again. Right. Yeah. Now, as the plates plunge toward the Earth or being pulled by gravity in this conveyor belt like fashion, there's a circulation, a stirring in the mantle. Uh, that's set up. You have this, this stirring as the plates are plunging, kind of indicated here by the white arrows. And uh, that circulates cooler material down to the core mantle boundary, just, to just above the liquid core. And it's thought that as the convection then increases as a result of that cool material down by the core, then you, then you, that will produce in the solid core a flipping of the Earth's magnetic field. And that's recorded, as we saw earlier, in this new ocean floor as it's being produced, this hot molten rock essentially coming up, for example, down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and it records the flipping of the magnetic field, right. which happened very quickly as a result of the increased convection in the liquid core, and then the solid core at the, at, in, the, in the, uh, the, the very center of the Earth flips back and right. forth. Now, the new ocean floor being produced is a lot hotter um, and, and therefore less dense than the, than the cold... Um, sinking ocean floor, so it rises between one or two kilometers uh, higher than the old ocean floor, leading to a global flood. Right. That's where yeah. you, you get your flood from. And it was Jacques Cousteau, actually, who said, it was not, wasn't a creationist, he said that there's enough water in the oceans today to flood the entire earth to a depth of more than two miles. Right. So what are you saying? If it, I mean, we live on the high parts, then you get the low parts, like the Marianas Trench. I mean, if you were to equal the earth out and it was like a perfect sphere, right. we'd be buried something like 2.8 kilometers everywhere on the planet. So yeah. there's enough water to do the job for a global flood. All you need is a little vertical adjustment between the ocean floor and the continents. Well, that's exactly what this model would have produced. Right. Now, chapter 11 in the Creation Answers book, uh, we produced the Creation Answers book. It answers the top 60 questions people ask about the creation evolution debate, this being one of them. Actually, what about uh, plate tectonics and things like that? And uh, it, it answers many and many of these questions. So we really encourage you to pick up that book. You can get it at creation.com on, on the web store. Um, and it discusses this and many more details, and we'll discuss it further when we get back. Is the human genome full of parasites? This might sound like a ridiculous question, but some biologists claim that it is. The Human Genome Project revealed that a large proportion of human DNA is composed of transposable elements. These DNA segments copy themselves and move around the genome. Some scientists have claimed they serve no function and have dismissed them as parasitic DNA. Evolutionists even claim that similarities with chimps in these supposedly useless bits prove evolution. But new research shows they have functions. One study revealed that transposable elements activate during embryo development in mice to control gene expression. Another study showed that these elements concentrate in gene-dense regions to control gene expression. They are not randomly spread throughout the genome as previously thought. So the human genome isn't full of parasites after all, but it's full of sophisticated ways to control gene expression. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So this catastrophic plate tectonic model, it, it fits very well with what the Bible uh, talks about. It does. Uh, it fits the time frame in the Bible, and it even provides a mechanism for the retreat of the floodwaters as well, as not just the, the breaking up the continents. Because for, for most of the duration of the flood, horizontal tectonic forces would have been the, the, the dominant uh, forces, of course. And then towards the end of the flood, it would have been vertical movement that would have been the more dominant forces and, and that would explain the continents coming up, the waters uh, you know, flowing off of them yes. and, uh, and, and so on. Yeah, once all of the heavy pre-flood ocean floor has, has subducted in that, that conveyor belt, that runaway subduction that we talked about, right. once there's no ocean floor left, there's nothing left to subduct. So the, the process, it starts very quickly, ends very quickly. And the whole process is very quick. Yeah. But then that hot, less dense ocean floor, that's because it's less dense, it sits higher on the mantle, it begins to cool and sink into the mantle. Well, right. now you've got, you've got vertical movements at the end of the flood explaining the runoff of the, uh, the floodwaters. Right. Now, this is a scientific model. <laughs> it's not just, you know, oh, it's just some religious thing, right? I mean, uh, yes. the concept comes from, obviously, we're looking at the physical things be, and, and interpreting according to what the Bible says, but this is a scientific model. Now, scientific models change. Sometime, 
significantly they do with with future discoveries and of course that, that's happening to both evolutionists and creationists um, but now Christians have a model that explains many of these large geological features that we see um, uh, around the earth and within a biblical context it's it's great that's and, right yeah and this model we, we believe is, is superior to the evolutionist model they have difficulties in some of their areas and you can read about that in that chapter in the creation answers book there but again just because evolutionists have explanations doesn't mean that their explanations are the best. In, right. in fact, evolutionists even have reasonable explanations, things that make sense. Right. Think, we, we can turn again to Mount St. Helens, that, that famous, you know, the, the, the key and one of the key evidences. And here you see a canyon at the base of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a volcano in southern Washington state in the U.S. And you see this canyon there, you see a little river running down the yep. middle of the bottom. And it is very reasonable to suppose that that river carved the canyon over hundreds or maybe into the thousands of years. Right. That's reasonable. Sure. You'd look at that evidence and you'd go, say, okay, what could have caused that? And that would be a reasonable explanation. Yes, but it's wrong. Right. Because, and, and, it, and, and here's where the importance of starting with the right history comes in. The right history of this canyon at the base of St. Helens here is that that canyon was carved in a day not hundreds of years or thousands of years, and the river had nothing to do with the formation of the canyon. Right. The river is an after effect. In fact, it's not the river caused the canyon, it's the canyon caused the river. Right. It's the opposite of what now, we now normally you, now think. Now you've got a ditch there, basically, that's collecting water. Right. The river wouldn't be there if the ditch wasn't there, yes. but the ditch wasn't caused by the, the river in the first place. So because we didn't start with the right history, you, you get there and you think, oh, well, it's, it, it makes sense that the river carved the canyon. And that does make sense. That's the point. Right, right. That's a reasonable explanation, but it's wrong. Right. Reasonable, but wrong. <laughs> and then we can look at, again, the, the, the side walls of the canyon here. You see this layer between the yellow dotted lines. That was laid down in about three hours. Beautiful summer evening, late evening, again, as a result of an eruption of the volcano. And if you look at a close-up view of that layer, you see this fine layering. Well. A reasonable view suggests that those layers, just millimeters thick than, that you see there on the screen, were laid down maybe one or two layers a year. Like, like we'd see in, let's say, the mouths of rivers or, or, or things we like that. If that you go out and you're today. observing that, you say, okay, we're getting a couple of layers per year here. You extrapolate that evidence. You look at this. You say, okay, well, it must have been one or two. You say, wow, it must have taken hundreds of thousands of years to lay down. That's very reasonable. Right. That's eminently reasonable. Sure. Nothing wrong with that. Yep. But it's wrong. Those layers in that photograph were not laid down over any length of time. And it was just, very, very fast. Just so, when I, when I have a skeptic, you know, and they say, well, it's unreasonable to consider that Noah's flood could have caused all these layers. It's like, well, wait a sec. These layers were laid down very quickly. Why is it unreasonable to think that the, the other layers were laid down? You know, it, it's not unreasonable. Right. We don't have unreasonable arguments, is my point as creationists. And, and Mount St. Helens did some pretty cool things. I mean, here's a picture of Grand Canyon. Uh, Mount St. Helens was only a few mud flows on the top of a mountain. What would a global flood do? Right. Now, you, you look at the, the things on a relatively small scale, still a pretty interesting scale at Mount St. Helens, yeah. and ramp everything up to the massive catastrophe of Noah's flood and the breakup of the continents, all kinds of things like that. Is that a better explanation for Grand Canyon? You know what? We've been to Grand Canyon many times and looked at that, and a flood is a great explanation for some of these things that we see here. Creation Magazine is a 56-page full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your subscription. Okay, we like to wrap up a lot of these programs with just looking at what's going on in the news. Mm -hmm. and, I th and I thought we'd, for this particular one on geology, mostly looking at geology, mm -hmm. we'd revisit something that we actually reported on in 94 in our Creation Magazine. We right. reported on it again in, uh, in one of the, la the latest issues here, uh, Creation Magazine from 2012, Frozen in Stone. And uh, we reported on this, this water wheel right. that has been encased in stone. And there's some new pictures taken just a little while ago of this water wheel. Here's 
water, obviously mineral-rich water, right. pouring over this water wheel, and obviously it didn't take millions of years to form. This is just <laughs> another example yeah, of... So you, you can see here the, the, the water would have come down the chute, yes. poured over the yep. water, the wheel would have turned and would have been used for some purpose, and then obviously the water must have contained some minerals or, or something, because basically that thing came to a grinding halt. <laughs> <laughs> But there's, it, it, it's, just, it's just another example of the things that we think take millions of years don't necessarily take millions of years under the right circumstances. Right. And what we've been talking about already on this show is, is, is you know, given a different history, things that often are assumed to take millions of years, like the laying down of layers and even fine layers and canyon cutting and so on, uh, take eons of time. Well, under the right conditions, they don't. Right. And so it feeds into the whole age of the earth thing, doesn't it? Exactly, yeah. And, and actually Noah's flood is the key to understanding the age of the earth. It really is. And, yeah. and so for many Christians that it might be sitting there going, yeah, but who cares about the age of the earth anyway? That doesn't have anything to do with my theology. Well, of course it does. Because if you think all those rock layers, those sedimentary layers with all the dead things in there, if you think they happened over the course of millions of years, and then let's say God created Adam and Eve and, 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 uh, in, in the garden. Well, you've got death before sin. We've pointed this out many times before. So this isn't just you know, some arbitrary uh, argument that we're making here on the show. We're not talking about geology because we just feel like talking about geology. We're yes, talking about yes. geology because of what God revealed in his word. So that's his revelation to us. So you know, our point in all of this and why we even have things like this in the Creation Magazine is to point out, look, we, you, you don't have to mess with what the Bible says. You don't have to reinterpret it. Right. You don't have to take the last 2,000 years, you know, r roughly of what Christians have believed about the Bible and throw it out the window because some, you know, you watch Discovery Channel one day and they said, oh, the earth's millions of years old. Well, let's think about it. If the earth's millions of years old and those sedimentary layers are millions of years old, then there was death before Adam sinned, and then what is Jesus saving us from? And you start messing around with a lot, a lot of things because Jesus made statements like, yeah, but from the beginning of the creation, he made the male and female. The beginning of creation. Beginning of creation, yes. not after 13 point something so billion years. Billion years, of, right. You know, and all these things. So we just want to give Christians a cohesive uh, worldview, one that fits with what the Bible says, in an uncompromising fashion. Yes, and the observ observations of the world around us. Right. Clearly the continents have broken up. Yep. How do Christians explain that? Well, we right. have an explanation that's actually superior to the evolutionists done by or initiated by the world's leading geophysicists in this area who right. developed the world's best 3D model of this, of this process. And Christians have no excuse for not accepting all of the Bible as accurate. Right. As God's word, as infallible. And then that in turn, of course, gets you to the point where you, you can stand on God's word, you can understand that, you can back up those scientific evidences, and when you go to share your faith, then you can also have answers That's for the skeptic. Support. Yes. It's, it's tremendous just to be able to stand on that, say, I trust God's word, and here's some reasons why uh, from science. <laughs>